Well, welcome everybody officially to this Blue Dog Speaker Series event. We're so happy to have you here and we're so grateful to have Mark Kapner here as our guest of honor tonight. So a little bit about Mark before he takes it over. Mark Kapner retired from Austin Energy in 2011 and is a freelance engineer. He led the design and implementation of Austin Energy's Green Choice Program, recognized by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory and US EPA as one of the most successful utility renewable energy marketing programs in the country. He was instrumental in the creation of the National Plug-in Partners Campaign to persuade automakers to manufacture plug-in hybrid vehicles. He invented a wind solar hybrid power system that incorporates two energy storage media that enables electric utilities to incorporate renewables at 90% penetration. He invented a cost-saving method for mounting solar panels. Mr. Kapner has spoken at numerous national and three European conferences on integrating wind and solar into electric grids, green energy marketing, energy storage, and plug-in vehicles. Without further ado, I'm turning it over to you, Mark. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Lachua. And uh, there we go. Uh, first, I want to start by thanking Ari, Ari Brish, for uh, suggesting to Alachua to invite me. So I'm going to try to cover a lot of ground in a few minutes. I will stop. I think I'll, I'll, I'll kind of divide this into 10-minute segments. Uh, after 10 minutes, I'll stop for questions, and then we'll pick it up again. So I'm going to talk about mostly renewable energy, that is wind, solar, hydro, uh, biomass, geothermal, um, specifically in Texas. But to do that, I really want to start off putting things in perspective. Um, this, I've done this chart. I've had to redo this chart almost every year or two as I give these presentations. <laughs> in fact, I started doing these presentations in, in uh, 1999 when I first joined Austin Energy. And the percentages were very different. Um, but here you see essentially four uh, categories of generation sources. And I should point out, I'm going to be talking about the generation end of the industry. Uh, I'm not going to say an awful lot about the transmission end or the distribution end. I will say uh, a little bit about the whole restructuring of the electric industry in Texas, which began in the mid-90s, actually, and has continued through. So to go back to, hello? Yeah. Um, okay, so here you see coal, natural gas, renewables, and nuclear. The trends have been over the past few years, especially coal has its share, which is 18% now. This is a total energy over the year. The coal share has decreased. Natural gas has always been the number one source by a wide margin. The nuclear hasn't changed much at all because we haven't got any new nuclear plants and probably won't. So that's been constant at about 11 or so. And the renewable share has grown tremendously from when I started doing this talk when it was basically about zero in the year 2000. And now we're up to 25%. Um, that 25% is 23% uh, of that is, is wind and about 2% of it is solar. And this is just to show a comparison of Texas on uh, which uh, on our generation mix. And you can see natural gas. It says natural. It doesn't say gas, but it's natural gas. <laughs> natural gas, then wind, then coal, nuclear, solar, and other. Um, nationwide, natural gas is the largest source of coal. And by the way, that's changed within the, tw within the last, I'm going to say, 20 years for sure. Originally, uh, 20 years ago, coal was the number one source and gas was number two. So they've switched. Um, and then nuclear, uh, nationwide nuclear is 20%. In Texas, it's only 11. A big difference in, uh, is between the nation and uh, Texas is Texas wind is at uh, 23 and uh, Texas and uh, nationwide wind is only, it's, it's I think 7% or so right now. Uh, there are sources which I don't even show because they're other and they're less than a percent in Texas, but um, hydro is a significant source. It's about 7% nationwide. Um, so that shows up and then there's biomass and, and a little bit of oil. Interestingly enough, even though Texas is an oil 
state. We hardly generate any electricity from oil. Um, natural gas is the source of fossil fuel and coal. And I should point out, coal is going to even, it's going to, it's going to shrink even more than it has already. By 2025, it's very possible that we will hardly be getting any of our energy from coal. But the renewable sources, going back historically to the first one, the original renewable source was hydro. It goes way back. The, those of you who know Austin's history, the, uh, the dam, which is now called the Miller Dam, on the Colorado River, at the time it was built in the 1890s, I think 1895, uh, it was, believe it or not, one of the largest hydroelectric dams in the world. They called it the, the, the Great Dam. Um, it's still there. Uh, it's been replaced. <laughs> the, the first hydro dam failed, the second one failed, and the third one was built by the Lower Colorado River Authority, and they own it and operate it, even though it's on Austin's in Austin territory. I'm not going to say much more about hydro in Texas because it is a very, very minor source. It's less than a percent, and most of that comes from the LCRA, the Lower Colorado River Authority. On the other hand, wind is the big growth picture in Texas. As I said before, it contributes now 23% of total energy. Uh, it has grown in uh, really in fits and starts, but it has grown over the uh, 20 years since the first wind farm in Texas was built in uh, Culberson County. And um, I'll be saying quite a bit more about wind. Uh, in terms of solar, it's only 2% now. But uh, as you'll see in a couple of slides, uh, this is going to grow at a phenomenal rate if the projects which have been proposed to be built in Texas, even if half of them get built, uh, solar will be much larger contribution than, it, than the 2% it is now. Um, I'm going to talk about two very, very different ways of getting electricity from the sun. Um, even though the talk I'm giving is very general uh, and, and really not technologically intensive, I, I will say a little bit about technologies of wind and solar. Uh, this project, by the way, that I've shown the picture of here, this is in Barstow, California, which was one of the first uh, solar plants of the kind. It's called a, a central receiver plant, uh, but I'll be talking more about this in a few minutes. Okay, a fourth a source of renewable energy is bioenergy. Um, this basically in in encompasses um, recovering methane from sanitary landfills, from uh, wastewater treatment plant, anaerobic digesters, um, from wood chips called bioenergy wood chip plant, uh, they call it biomass, basically using the residue of the logging industry. That is those portions of the tree that are not used for timber or, or uh, pulp and paper, uh, basically the treetops. When they cut down a tree, the treetops are essentially left in the forest. They could be used, they could be uh, chipped and used as fuel for a wood fire power plant. Texas has them. We have one that's somewhat infamous <laughs> in, for Austin. It's not in Austin. It's actually in uh, Nacogdoches area. But um, uh, in, in as much as biomass is also a very, very tiny portion of our energy mix, I'm going to focus on the two biggies, uh, wind and solar. Okay, a couple of words about modern wind turbines. Um, you could describe a wind turbine in several ways, one of which is its electrical rating at 2.5 megawatts, but most people have no idea what a megawatt means. So what's more, what's more significant is, is how big are they? Typical towers of the large wind turbines that have been installed in recent years in Texas, the typical tower is 300 feet. Okay, we're talking about the size of a football field or I think a better example is the Texas Tower at the university. Uh, blades of a machine of this size, 140 feet long. So they're sweeping an area 
a circular area of 280, a little bit more than 280, almost 300 uh, feet diameter. And in terms of what does 2.5 megawatts mean? Well, Texas wind turbine of this size, over the course of a year, it will generate about as much energy as 700 average homes use, average Austin homes use. Okay, a picture just to give you a sense of the scale. You see the two guys up there? Um, here is one of my technology talks, and I can go on and on about this, but I won't. <laughs> but what I want to show here is a little bit of the engineering that's going into modern wind turbines. Number one, the rotor of the turbine, that is the three blades, um, their optimal turning rate is about 20 revolutions per minute. That might seem slow, but the tip speed is very high. Uh, that's, that's basically the most efficient, they've determined the most efficient way of getting energy from the wind is to turn it at about 20 RPM when your uh, swept area is uh, 140 foot radius or 280 foot diameter. Well, the generator generator has to turn at about 900 RPM for most generators that are built today. So you got to speed up your shaft that's going to drive the generator at 900 from 20. So that's a 45-fold gear ratio. So there's a gearbox. In fact, a lot of the housing that, you, that I showed in the previous slide, I'll just go back to there, a, a good part of that housing is the multi-stage gearbox. Um, in addition to that, uh, interestingly enough, the rotor, those three blades of the modern wind turbine, in almost every case, they are driven into the wind by a motor called the yaw motor and the yaw drive shown there. And the purpose of that is to um, be able to operate the wind turbine with the, the blades upwind of the tower. So they don't suffer the same effect if they were downwind of the shadowing of the, of the blade, so to speak. So there's that drive. Then in addition to that, there's a wind speed indicator, an anemometer. Its purpose is to feed information to the blades, which are adjustable. Their pitch is adjustable. It's important that the blade uh, tilt, that the blade pitch is uh, adjusted when the winds get stronger than a certain speed, typically in the about 28 miles an hour. Uh, if they get any stronger than that, and if the blades kept operating, uh, they would overdrive the generator and burn out the generator. So uh, they basically are designed to spill the wind if you've, if you've heard that term, that's something we use a lot in sailing. They're basically letting some of the wind, which could otherwise be doing work on the blades, just pass over the blades. So they actually uh, change the pitch of the blades in response to the wind speed. And I think that's enough about the technology. Um, I'll just make one more point. Uh, we owe Denmark a real debt for having spent a lot of money to build an, an industry in Denmark in the really in the early 70s and continuing on, they did a lot of the research. Denmark did a lot of the early development work, the research and development work, and then for the purpose of basically making the Danish wind industry uh, grab a substantial market share of the world's wind turbines. And that actually happened. For some years, uh, more than 50% of all the wind turbines in the world were manufactured in Denmark, including the early turbines that were going into projects in Texas. Well, obviously, other countries have caught on and they've developed their own wind industry, as we have as well. But uh, I'm just going to point out that uh, we should be thankful to the Danes. OK, um, this slide shows basically where where most of the wind farms are. The only drawback is somehow or other, uh, the bottom of the slide got cut off. There are wind farms along the coast, along the Gulf Coast as well. But uh, you'll also notice that there's, there's really nothing very close to Travis County. 
And obviously, you put the wind farms where the winds are the strongest. Okay, here's something we could be proud of in Texas. <laughs> Look where Texas stands compared to all the other to the next nine states. We're head and shoulders above. I should point out, I'm going to make a comment now about the governor's um, statement that uh, the the Green New Deal and Texas wind is, were the cause of the, of the uh, power outages. Absolute nonsense. And I can say more about that later. <laughs> but I've usually, you know, up until the, the incident uh, last month, the, the, uh, obviously the deep freeze and all that happened, um, this was definitely a good news story for Texas. We should be proud that we're, we're at 25,000 megawatts where the next state is only a little bit over 5,000. That's Iowa. Um, if Texas were a country, I think we'd be fifth or sixth in the world in terms of wind capacity. Okay. Now for the downside of wind, um, the, the purple shows over the course of 24 hours, a typical, this is averaged over many, many months, a typical load profile. That is the, the load, um, this is normalized. So basically the peak load is, is shown as one. So that's the load profile. The lower uh, curve, the dark blue is a fairly typical average wind energy profile for most of the wind farms in Texas. And you'll see that they're mirror images. That is, the winds are the highest in the middle of the night, and they're the lowest in the late afternoon or in the afternoon when the load is the highest. So there's a mismatch here. That hasn't really been a terrible problem so far, um, but it will, uh, it will surface as a problem in the future. And I'll show you in a few slides where wind is going to be uh, in 2025. Um, I should point out also, uh, one of the first rules of electric power, utility electric power, in any electric power system, the load, that is the instantaneous rate of usage, and the generation, the instantaneous generation, at every moment in time must match exactly. If they're off even a fraction of a percent, the system operator, in our case, our system operator is the Electric Reliability Council of Texas. They must take corrective action to make sure they match. If it goes on for too long, which could be actually even several minutes, really, really bad things can start happening, which really means power outages. Uh, generating plants, the term they use, they will trip out to protect themselves from this discrepancy between the instantaneous load and the instantaneous rate of generation. Okay, I said I'd stop after a few minutes, and I think this is a good time because I'm going to move on to the next source. So I'll take questions. Or I'll move on. <laughs> it's, up, it's up to you. Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Um, Let me unmute. I'm sorry. Go yeah. ahead. Yeah. Uh, the, you raised the uh, issue with respect to some uh, <clears throat> confusion, if you will, uh, announced from, uh, from Austin on what actually happened with wind generation. <clears throat> and what we've come to learn is a failure to equip the wind generating devices with uh, protection against low temperatures. Right. What is that protection? You've given us a diagram of what those machines are. Sure, sure. Yeah. Actually, it's very simple. It's, it's uh, I mean, it, it, the wind turbines are operating in all kinds of very, very cold environments. They, what they did is those wind turbines were ordered with a winterization package, which effectively they actually keep the blades warm enough so the ice doesn't form on the blades. They could do that in two ways. Uh, and it's both winterization techniques are used. They blow hot air down the blade because the blades are basically hollow, or they use what's called heat tracing, which is uh, an electric 
wire, electric resistance wire, which goes the length of the blade and keeps the blades warm. I think the, the hot air method is the most common. But uh, again, that's a winterization package. Obviously, the wind turbines in Texas, they didn't bother ordering that package because it costs more. And as was the case with all of generation, and I should point out, I'm going to get into this at the very end, is the mistakes that were made and why we had such a, a horrific incident of extended outages in February 4, the week of the week of the 14th. Actually started on the 11th, Thursday night, but it really got bad on the 14th and 15th and then continued. So I'll be saying more about that, but for the time being, just to complete the answer, um, the decisions were made by the uh, companies that were installing those machines that it is so unlikely that we're going to have an extended deep freeze that we're not going to bother with the winterization package. The same decisions, I should point out, were made by the gas industry, the uh, operators and owners of the gas wells, the gas transmission system, and the power plants. Same decisions were made. It's such an unusual event, we're not going to bother. We'll just live through it. Those were the decisions that were made years ago. It's sort of like uh, a hundred year flood we build dams for. We don't build dams for a 500 year flood. It's kind right, of hi Sandy. <laughs> so I have a question, Mark. Number sure. one, one's, one's serious and one sounds ridiculous, but I'm half serious. Um, how much more wind capability or capacity is on the books to be built? That's one question. Number two, okay. I got actually three questions. Number two, the, the trick with wind is storage. That's hard to do. Is there more uh, innovation or technology yeah. uh, coming yeah. on storage, which would help that discrepancy in your chart? Right. Okay. Number, and uh, yeah. Talk, okay. Talk, and, and there's number three also? Number, or, or? number three, this is the crazy question on yeah. biomass. Every time I look at a patch of prickly pear, I think, my God, if we could turn that into biomass, we could have a, another source of power across the <laughs> Okay, question number one, um, uh, we're now at about 25, okay, I'm, I'm going to use the term again, megawatts, but this is only for use just to uh, give you a sense of proportions. We're now at 25,000 megawatts, as I showed on that ch chart before, that was way head and shoulders above, above Iowa and California, etc. Um, there are 20, there is another approximately 25,000 megawatts more of wind farms that are, um, I'm going to use the term, in the transmission study queue. Well, now, what that means is all the new generation projects have to go through a study by ERCOT to determine how they will impact the transmission system, how much more transmission would need to be built to accommodate them. And uh, those studies are going on right now. Every new project has to go through the studies. There are 25,000 megawatts of projects, and, and these are tens of projects for wind that are in that queue. That means there are businesses, there are developers who put money up to have those studies done, and they, they have land under option to lease for wind, and they are prepared financially to build wind farms if they're approved. They won't all be approved. Many of them will. So the the answer to your question is we're gonna uh, we could effectively double the wind capacity that we have now. Uh, likely it won't be doubled, but it'll be substantial increase. Um, let's see the second no, the second question about storage. Oh, storage. Yeah, I'll be getting into that toward the end of the presentation. So I'll save that for later. Prickly pears, yeah, right. There's a lot of stuff that's that's been used for biomass. Um, if we have time at the end, I've basically I've left the biomass slides that I'm going to show you and the discussion uh, for only if there's time left. So let's let's get into that later. Okay. Um, other so, questions? So I have a question. I have a yeah. question. The biomass, the oil, the coal and the gas, is that all done by heating water and turning, spinning uh, generators, or is there some other technology for that? Okay, uh, there's basically two kinds of power plants, uh, to, to put things in very simple terms. There are steam power plants 
which uh, do boil water, superheat the, uh, the, they make steam, superheat the steam and expand it through a steam turbine. That's type number one. Type number two, they don't actually do it with water. They do it with air. And type number two, <coughs> they're called either gas turbines. Well, they're called gas turbines. There's, there's a couple of different kinds, but the, the basic process is rather than boiling water, boiling pressurized water, I should say, making steam, superheating steam, they uh, start off with air. They suck in air. They compress air. Then they burn the fuel to heat that compressed air, and then they expand that heated compressed air through a gas turbine, and that drives a generator. So there's there's water, there's there's steam power plants, and there's gas fired power plants uh, that are using gas turbines. Uh, I trust that oh, that so, answers your question. Yeah. So all of those are using heat. Yeah. So why why would they have problem in deep cold then? Uh, I'll be getting into this also at the end of the presentation. Yeah. But uh, okay. uh, just to, to give you a hint of what it is, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of instrumentation uh, in Texas. We 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 un unlike the north or most of the rest of the country where it gets real cold sometimes. Uh, Texas does not bother to put uh, equipment in housing. We le we leave everything outdoors. Uh, so we don't have to air condition it during the summer. Our problems are more operating in the very high temperature, very hot temperatures than the cold. So a lot of equipment uh, such as instrumentation, um, as well as some of the water, water lines are outdoors and exposed to the outdoor temperature. Uh, that's, that's been the problem. That was the problem during the week of February 14th. Okay, okay other questions? Now now uh my nephew is working with biodiesel in connecticut i don't know i don't know what came of the project uh but the, my question was uh renewable yeah. you know my nephew in houston is is you know is really building he's got you know really building the uh the home uh, uh solar panel and is that they are actually selling power back. Are there yeah. any figures on how much power is being sold back? Yeah, there yes, there is. In fact, I'm gonna to get to solar, right? I'm just about to start doing the solar portion. So if there aren't any other questions, I'll move on. Okay, I said before this two, two essentially very different ways of taking sunlight and making power. Uh, I call one the solid state physics method, that is the photovoltaics or solar cells. Um, let's see, yeah, yeah. Can, can you see my, uh, can you see my cursor? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay, well, here we are. This is an array of solar pho photovoltaics or PV is the short term. And the other way is uh, we call this the mechanical engineers. Uh, it's either called concentrating solar thermal well, that's it. Basically, this this uses mirrors and uh, uses heat. So this is a heat. It's called a heat engine or a device which takes heat and turns it into mechanical energy. Um, so let's move on. I'll start off with the the second kind first. This is the uh, a concentrating solar thermal. The whole idea here is to concentrate sunlight to raise high temperature heat. And there are several uh, different kinds of, of systems, technologies that do this. All of them revolve around the nature of a parabola. Remember parabola from uh, geometry? Well, a parabolic mirror has the characteristics that it is the way that you concentrate sunlight onto a small space. The parabolic dish, as it's called, concentrates the light onto an engine. It's a kind of a heat engine. It's called a Stirling engine. It really resembles a car engine with uh, pistons in cylinders. Uh, I'll just say right now, the whole idea here is you're taking very high temperature heat and you're doing what in the car engine the uh, burning of gasoline does, but you're doing it with solar energy instead. Uh, another kind, I showed the picture of this before, it's called a central receiver. Here, the parabola is not just 
a single mirror. It's a collection of many mirrors. And these could be flat mirrors. They, they track the sun and collectively they focus all that sunlight that they collect onto a boiler at the top of a tower. The boiler makes uh, steam, high pressure steam. The steam goes to a steam turbine and it's a, from then on, it's pretty much a conventional steam power plant. A third kind is a parabolic trough, okay? This one uses curved mirrors. They track the sun from east to west. They concentrate the sunlight onto tubes. And the idea here is you want to collect all that heat. And the heat in this case is about 750 degrees Fahrenheit. Rather than do it with water, which you could, if you did it with water, you would obviously have to pressurize the water because it boils at atmospheric pressure, it boils at 212 degrees. Rather than water, they use a, a synthetic oil, which is called a heat transfer fluid. So they're piping that oil through these pipes that are receiving all that heat from those parabolic mirrors. And basically that goes to a heat exchanger, which takes the heat from that hot oil, turns, uh, boils water, superheats the steam, and that superheater steam then goes to a steam turbine. And here again, conventional steam turbine. Um, in addition, let's see, I think we show an oil heater. Yeah, th this kind of power plant lends itself to making it into a hybrid. That is, with the simple addition of a heater using natural gas or oil or what, it, it's actually natural gas in most cases, you can keep this plant running into the evening as long as you want to run it because it'll run off that, that heat. And then the next morning as the sun rises, you turn the burner off and you gather heat from the solar. So that's, I should point out, since I'm talking to Blue Knot, and I believe most of us have some connection to Israel. This is not in Israel. This is in California. However, the company that developed this technology, um, and here it's using, it's being used at an enormous scale. Uh, most of this was built in the late 80s, early 90s. The company that built it is called Luz, L-U-Z. Luz is an Israeli company. They don't build their power plants in Israel. Interestingly enough, they build them in California, or they did. Unfortunately, Luz went under, uh, but... Uh, in the in the early 1990s, but before they went under, they were the biggest solar company in the world by far, and it was largely based on this technology of parabolic troughs. So uh, again, the plants in California, there's there's a total of nine of them. This shows, I think, three. Uh, these are in the Mojave Desert, uh, two places. Uh, Harper Lake, I think, or, or, or I should say Har Harper Junction and Barstow and Kramer Junction. There's actually three locations. Um, so there, there is an Israeli connection here. OK, I should point out also that the kind of power plants I've been showing so far that use mirrors that are called concentrating solar thermal, they only work in deserts, in desert climates where there's what's called a very high level of direct solar radiation. There's two kinds of sunlight. There's direct solar and there's diffuse. Most uh, are Austin, as well as most of East Texas, we get a lot of diffuse solar radiation. The diffuse is not used at all by the solar, by the concentrating solar. They only use direct. Therefore, those power plants I showed you are all in deserts or desert climates. Photovoltaics use both direct and diffuse. They're, they're totally usable by solar. Um, I'll now talk a little bit about photovoltaics. Uh, almost all of it is silicon. Most of it now is crystalline silicon. So it starts off with the same raw material as semiconductors. Um, at the beginning of the solar industry, the solar cells were way too expensive to be considered for utility scale. However, in places where you had no utility lines and you wanted to do something like pump water 
and you were very far from the utility, it didn't make sense to pay the utility to bring your power line out to you. It made much more sense to, to use, uh, for example, for, for pumping water, it made much more sense to either have a diesel generator or solar cells. Solar cells turned out to be competitive with diesel, so a lot of the water pumping in, uh, in Texas actually use solar cells to run the pumps. No concern about storage because you just run the pump whenever, uh, whenever there's sun and you store the water. Okay, as the cost of solar has come down, we, begun to, we began to see it used. Uh, now we're going back really to the uh, mid-80s, early 90s. We began to see solar panels used on buildings such as homes. It was still very expensive and would only only make sense if there was a, a substantial uh, incentive. And there have been very substantial federal government tax incentives to make solar cost effective. Um, but as the industry grew, uh, the, uh, the costs have come down. Actually, I'll give you a number. Since the early 1970s, the cost of solar cells and solar panels such as this have actually come down by, uh, by a figure of 100 times. In other words, the solar panels, which cost 60 to $70 per unit, in 1970 cost 60 to 70 cents today per unit for the same unit. So here's a project that we did a very early days when I first got here on the Wild Basin Preserve. This was done around 1999. Uh, then Austin Energy did a project right across the street from the Austin Energy headquarters. This is the Palmer Events Center. And we put up an array of solar panels which serve the purpose of also shading the cars a little bit, as well as producing electricity. Now, solar panels make direct current. We use alternating current. So you got to do something. You turn direct current to alter alternating current in a device called an inverter. And this is a group of inverters at the Palmer Event Center, which enable that solar energy to feed into the power uh, system the AC power system of the of the building. Uh, just one more picture, a couple more pictures. Uh, this is an array on the Austin Convention Center on the um, the west. It's the northwest corner where there's a big solar. It's basically a very very large window solarium almost facing west. So it had to be shaded. So we figured if we're going to shade it, why don't we use solar panels to shade it as well? Austin Convention Center. I'm sorry, we just showed that. City Hall. This is an array of solar panels. Most people don't know if it's there, but you sit here during the summer to watch the concerts. And there's a stage out over here. And we designed this particular array so that looking at it from underneath, it lets the light through and creates a, a very pleasing light waffle, kind of a waffle light pattern. So the solar cells here are spaced out between two layers of glass. Okay, there's really two ways of, of deploying solar panels. Um, one is distributed on homes, on buildings, like I just showed. Uh, uh, there are maybe 6,000 systems in Austin right now uh, that are feeding energy back to the grid uh, when they produce more than the home uses. So the question before was how much are they feeding back? It really depends how big the systems are. Um, Austin Energy gives an incentive. They actually buy the energy that you're producing. They, they meter it and they buy it. And the price is very, very close to the price they charge you for the electricity. So you're getting full value for the for the solar you produce. Um, they don't really encourage you to produce too much more than you use, but uh, some people do. They put on as much as they possibly can. When, when I started uh, with Austin Energy, uh, when I was asked to work on the solar program to develop a program of incentives, um, we actually paid up front. We paid uh, a certain amount of money 
uh, they typically came it to about ten thousand dollars toward the cost of the solar power system, which cost the owner two thousand uh, twenty thousand dollars. We we were paying half. Um, the cost of solar has come down even since then so much that right now Austin Energy really doesn't pay you much at all at the beginning. They only pay you for the energy you produce, um, but that's enough to make it worthwhile for people to do it. Uh, reasonable payback. So I kind of got off the topic. I said there's two ways of deploying solar. There's distributed solar, which is on buildings for the most part. And then there's large solar farms. Here's an example of a solar farm or, or just a piece of a solar farm. This particular one was Austin Energy's first solar farm. It's in Weberville, which is east of Austin, but it's much sunnier as you go west. So this is probably the only solar farm that was built close to Austin. Uh, then they decided from now on, we're going to buy energy from solar farms built in the sunnier part of the state. And I've got a slide coming up in a moment that will show you the difference between Austin and West Texas. But the uh, in terms of numbers, there is far, far more solar today in the form of utility scale solar farms like this than on buildings. OK, here's the, the chart I was going to show you. Um, what is kilowatt hours per square meter per day? What does that mean? You don't have to know that. <laughs> what that means, and of course, it's, it's a relative scale. This actually translates into the what we call full uh, equivalent full sun hours per day. What does that mean? It means the amount of energy per day on average over the course of a year that you're going to get is equal to the energy from the sun as if the sun were at its height and the skies were totally clear and you get this amount of energy this is the number of hours of equivalent full energy that you're getting so you can see um, Travis County is sort of right around the borderline between the the, the 4.7 to 5.1 and the 5 to 5.5 and but the real solar intense part of Texas. And of course, everybody knows the further you, you go west, the sunnier it gets. So most of the solar farms are going to be in the uh, in the range of the 5.9 to 6.2, and especially the 6.2 to 6.6. .6. Obviously, the sunnier it is, the more energy you make for the same investment cost. OK, Texas doesn't look so good so far <laughs> compared to the other states. Um, this is going to change a lot, though, very soon. Uh, California clearly has led the nation. Uh, as we have led in wind, California has led in solar. Um, why is that? Well, it's very simple. In Texas, the developers of power plants build power plants to make money. They don't build power plants that cost more over time than they're going to recover when they sell the electricity. And for the most part, Texas itself, statewide, really doesn't do anything to motivate or incentivize solar the way California does in a very big way. That's why California has a lot and we have a little. But as I mentioned before, the cost of solar has come down since the early 70s by a factor of 100. And a lot of that has been in recent years. I should also point out, just like I said, for, uh, for wind, we owe the Danes a, a real debt of gratitude. Hey, we owe China. <laughs> China set out not to do research and development. We did the research and development in solar. China took all that research and development science in semiconductors and manufacturing, and they decided about 10 years ago, maybe more than 10 years ago, the government decided they are going to invest in their solar photovoltaics industry and dominate the world. They did. More than 50% of world market share is coming out of China for solar panels, including almost everything in Texas. OK, um, I put this slide in to show what's planned 
Well, I, I mentioned before the interconnection queue. That, that is, the, these are projects that are that have been proposed by companies that have money that they've invested or they they're prepared to invest. They have land. They have the technology. Uh, they've got the supply chains worked out. They're ready to go as soon as the ERCOT gives them permission. Look where solar is. Now, I use the term GW. That stands for gigawatts. A gigawatt is a 1,000 megawatts. You really don't have to, have to know what that actually means just to get a sense of the relative scale. Texas has a lot of solar Oh, I should point out also, yeah. Okay, so it's now, it's about, I think it's 73 megawatts, uh, th I'm sorry, 73 gigawatts of solar in the queue, okay? Right now we have 5,000 megawatts. We have five now, we're gonna get 73 more if they all get built. And a wind, as I sh showed you before, wind is, is about 25 gigawatts more. We have 25 now, it's gonna double. Interesting thing, the uh, reason I put this in is, look where natural gas is. There's some natural gas planned, but very, very little compared to wind and solar. This reflects business and economics and the way that companies that are in these technologies see the future. And the way they see the future is the future is solar and wind Batteries even exceed, uh, this is all the new battery plants proposed for energy storage, uh, that, that even exceeds natural gas. Okay, I want to compare Texas, and this is in terms of total energy over, over the course of a year, where Texas is today, and I showed you this slide, or this, this actually came from the other slide, we're, we're now we're 47% natural gas. We're 20, uh, this shows 20% coal, um, yeah, 20% 20, 20 wind. We're actually 23% wind. We're 2% we're solar, and we are some, some coal. The coal has even shrunk from this time to 18, and the wind is actually 23. Okay, but if those projects that I just showed before get built, here's where we're going to be. And for people who are, uh, by the way, I haven't even mentioned climate change and uh, carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas emissions. <laughs> haven't mentioned those at all because so far I've talked about technology and business. These decisions are made based not on how green these companies are. The greenness is the byproduct. The companies that are doing these things and that are going to create this situation so here we go. Solar is going to be next to wind. Next to wind, wind is 39. Solar is going to be 36, and wind and solar together are going to be three quarters of the total. 10% unchanging nuclear, and gas is going to be down to 15. Gas and coal, if there is any coal, it'll be mostly gas. So again, just to make the point, this is not happening because the solar and wind companies are true believers in the need to address climate change. That's a byproduct. Their main reason to do it is because it makes business sense. Okay, this is somewhat of a controversial slide. These numbers all call, come from the Energy Information Administration. And what they really show is this kind of a range, you know, the, the green is the low, the, um, the light blue is the low end and the, the dark blue is the high end. Really, all you can get from this is that uh, wind and solar are just about the same true cost of producing. Uh, they're lower than coal. And if you were to look at compared to natural gas, wind and solar are less expensive. The way that the ERCOT wholesale power market operates and I'm going to try to say, say something which is extremely complex. I'll try to put it in as simple terms as I can. There's a number of reasons why Texas has the lead in wind and why we're going to have so much solar. So I'm going to try to say an awful lot in one slide. Number one, the obvious. We got the resource. We have the land. 
we have the flat, relatively flat land that's very windy and it's very sunny. ERCOT market rules. Okay, ERCOT is Electric Reliability Council of Texas. The market rules essentially are how ERCOT decides which power plants to run for how long and at what level. And those market rules that they go by, it's called an energy only market. Unlike most other states and most other power grids, ERCOT basically makes its decision on what power plants to run using a daily market, a daily uh, auction. Some people call it a reverse, a reverse auction because low price wins. It's as if they're going out for bid for supply every day, a day ahead, and every hour of the day. They bring in bids from all of the generators, and they stack those bids from low to high, and they determine how much energy are they going to need every hour of the next 24 hours. And those plants, which are part of the bid stack and the bids basically they they stack up the generation bids until they have enough to meet what they expect to be the load that hour and all those plants receive the price of the highest bid price what's called the marginal price that way of running the power system and choosing which plants to rent to run is very very favorable to an energy source such as wind or solar, which has very, very low or almost zero cost of operation. Their cost is all capital. Once they've decided to build it, they know they're going to get whatever the highest price is every hour for the year. And they decide, you know, we can make money building solar and building wind. That's why we have so much in the queue. Well, we have so much already and why we have so much in the queue. Okay, uh, since I'm on this slide, and by the way, I'm, I should, oh, let me see what time it is, <laughs> how much time I have left. Oh my God, okay. I should have stopped for questions, but I'm, I'm gonna just, uh, actually, I said I'd talk about storage, so I'll come back to this later. Okay, energy storage. I've spent a lot of my career actually working in the energy storage field. Several technologies, and this is only a, a this is only a cursory look at energy storage. Right now, 93% of all the energy storage in the world is pumped hydro, hydroelectric plant. Where during the off-peak hours, during the time when you want to store energy, you're pumping energy using a pump, a motor-driven pump, pumping it up a hill to a reservoir, an upper reservoir. When you want to generate it's a conventional power plant. You release the valves, you reverse the flow, the water comes down, it drives a turbine, a hydro turbine, which drives a generator. Again, 95% of all the storage right now, this is how they do it. Nothing in Texas. Reason? We don't have the terrain where we have the water. Batteries, this is the new source. Many kinds of batteries. Lots and lots of battery energy storage being built today. Hydrogen, interesting. H hydrogen might actually be the, the preferred source for very, very long duration energy storage. Uh, basically, the key to this is a device called an electrolyzer. It's an electrochemical device which takes electricity and uses it to split water. You can do this at home. Anybody could do Electro, uh, electrolysis. Uh, you get hydrogen on one anode on one of the wires, and you get hydrogen on the other. You store the hydrogen, and the, the beauty of hydrogen is it's it's relatively inexpensive to store massive quantities of hydrogen the same way as we store natural gas in underground caverns. And then to convert the hydrogen back to electricity. You have several options. You've got fuel cells. I won't say much about that now. Uh, or you can run the hydrogen along with natural gas into a conventional power plant. Compressed air. 
What you do here is during the time you want to store energy, you run a air, you run a giant air compressor, store that air underground in a cavern. When you want to get the energy out, you release it. Uh, you heat it up a little bit first. You heat it up, uh, and then you expand that compressed air uh, through an air turbine. Makes power. Uh, I'm not going to talk about this because this is uh, off. Uh, this is basically just a way to store energy in a building where um, you store cold energy. You, you produce cold, cold water or ice in the middle of the night and use that pump that cold out rather than run a chiller during the afternoon hours. So you're basically shifting your electric usage from the afternoon to the middle of the night. Oh, there we are. Okay, that's my email address. But um, at this point, I will stop and invite questions because I think I've used up almost all my time. Okay, let's go back to, there we are. Okay, Alachua, if you're still there, if you want to. Uh... Mark? There we are. Oh, okay, great. Hi. Mark, yeah. Mark, this is Stuart. I, I have a question. So you, you sure. talked about the uh, new capacity being almost entirely, you know, wind and, and solar. Yeah, um, and you talked about it, it that it's a, a business decision. But do you think that business decision is partially um, made because they see that the government incentives and such going forward are going to be geared towards um, non-carbon producing sources, or do you think it's, it's just entirely um, current cost? Um, this is it's interesting. Uh, the the tax incentives, the federal tax incentives for both wind and solar. Are, are gradually disappearing. They're being phased out. Um, on, the other, on the other hand, the reason they're being phased out is because uh, the cost of these, both wind and solar, have come down and appear to be continuing to come down, but they've already come down enough. Even if they don't come down anymore, they've come down enough so that these projects make business sense under the Texas market rules, the ERCOT market rules. Um, if I had more time, I would go back to that slide where I was showing why does Texas lead the rest of the country in wind and, and why we have so much solar coming in. But uh, I can tell you this, um, one of the differences between Texas and most other areas of the country are uh, policy decisions. One of those policy decisions is the way that Texas um, plans new transmission lines. These all results from a 2005 legislative action. There was a bill passed in 2005. It's called the Competitive Renewable Energy Zone Bill. And in a nutshell, I mean, trying to summarize a whole bill in, in a few words, uh, it basically directed the Public Utility Commission to conduct studies and determine where builders of wind farms and solar farms are committed to build their projects that are not currently served by transmission. It, it's a process by which they put up money into an escrow account to tell the policymakers, we are serious about building in these locations. And it gave the Public Utility Commission authorization to direct the construction of transmission to those areas. Number two, Unlike many other places, the way Texas uh, owners of transmission recover their costs, it's different from many other places. The costs are distributed among all of the users in the state. Those costs, uh, for example, for those new power lines that are going to wind and solar places, the wind and solar farms are not burdened with the cost of those transmission lines the way they are in other states. Transmission costs are spread out over all users in proportion to their peak demand on the system. So it's uh, it's it's been it's been called socialization of transmission. <laughs> 
I'm not sure if that goes over so well in Texas, but in reality, we pay for transmission the same way we pay for farm to market roads to get them built. This was before the idea of tolling, where the cost of these roads were not uh, put on the on the on the farmers themselves. They were spread out over the entire population of Texas. That's how transmission gets built. So those two or three changes. Uh, those are policy decisions that have been made by the legislature. Those are the, the main reasons why Texas is uh, where it is relative to the other states. Thanks okay, so Harry. Yeah. Uh, when back in the days when wind was 10% or so, the fluctuations were not a big issue. But now when you saw that renewable energy becoming 70%, yeah. The fluctuations of sun and wind becomes a, a major challenge on, on right. how to balance. So what, what's the strategy, how to balance? Yeah. OK, uh, this is interesting um, to reflect on that question. Back in around 2000, the, the general thinking amongst utility folks who operate systems, operate power plants, the, the general conventional wisdom was wind should never be more than 5% of the system because of the fluctuation you talked about. Okay, right now it's it's way over. It's, there are times, there are times when wind is 50% of the total system load. Not all the time, obviously, but there are times when the load is relatively low and the winds are very strong. So they've learned, and this, I guess the, the answer to your question is, we've learned a lot over the past 20 years on how to operate electric power systems that are mixes of dispatchable units, that is conventional power plants, especially the conventional plants, which have very, very fast response rates, can ramp up and ramp down very quickly. Um, this wasn't really very well understood at the beginning, but we've learned we really count on the responsiveness of the fleet of gas, it's almost all gas now, gas-fired power plants that are very, very rapid response can ramp up and ramp down very quickly. We count on those to be available to make up the difference between the load and the wind and the solar that's coming in. And again, it's partly learning that lesson and learning how to, how to deploy them um, we've also learned a lot about how to predict in the near future, the next hour, two or three, uh, where the winds are going to be and where the sun is going to be. Probably easier to predict the sun than the wind, <laughs> obviously. But we've gotten really good at mathematical models which predict two or three hours ahead. And we rely on those models and we rely on the um, responsiveness of many of the gas-fired power plants. I should point out, we are not going to see gas-fired power plants taken out of service unless they're really old and inefficient. We're not going to see those plants taken out of service even if we were, uh, if we had 100% capability from wind and solar because we need them, obviously, when the winds and the sun, when the wind and the sun does not match the load. We need all those plants to be kept in service. They won't be used nearly as much, and they won't make so much money, but they still have to be there to make up the difference. So, good question. Um, Other questions. What percentage of the uh, of the wind power do they do, do they not use? I'm sorry. What's the, what's the question? What percentage of the wind production of electricity do they choose not to use? How much of that potential is wasted? Well, right now, uh, it's it's really okay. How can I say this? There are to, there are times where a local wind farm would have would would overload the power lines it's mostly it, it's the issue now is really the the power transmission capability um there are times and i i don't know exactly what they are but it's 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 a few percent of the total annual production but uh there are wind farms that are located in places where the power lines have not been beefed up enough to carry 
all the energy they could produce when they're operating at their max. So ERCOT orders them to curtail. So really that the term curtailment is, is the proper term to use. Um, that was a lot more serious in, in the years before 2005 when the legislature responded to the wind industry, which had, I should point this out, in the, in the early 2000s, the wind industry was building in places where the transmission lines were not adequate. They were expecting the transmission builders to beef up their lines. Uh, that was a very bad assumption. The transmission builders <laughs> said, we can't do it unless the Public Utility Commission orders us to. And the Public Utility Commission said, we can't order you to because the legislature uh, would have to act and direct us to authorize those lines. So the answer to your question is, it was much worse in the years before 2005 and it's not as bad now. However, there will always be times where a, a local condition, there are places where the transmission system still needs more beefing up to accommodate the, the growth of, of wind. Um, I, I don't know the answer precisely, but again, th there is a percentage of uh, curtailment, which, which obviously hurts the wind farm guys because, you know, if you've got a machine you've paid for, and it could be producing energy and you're curtailed, you're, it's like throwing dollar bills up into the wind and they go away. They, they, they need the plants where they store the hydrogen. And well, they, yeah. And they yeah. can put them in autonomous Tesla trucks and send them to where the fuel cells <laughs> are all over the state. Actually, uh, this is the, I'm giving a presentation in two weeks to the IEEE. I've been working with... Uh, uh, two graduate students at UT, mechanical engineering, on large-scale energy storage, specifically using hydrogen to do just what you mentioned, to place the electrolyzer stations near where the wind farms and the solar farms are, uh, where you could put the energy into hydrogen rather than overload a transmission line. So uh, what, you, what you pointed out is exactly uh, what's under study. Uh, it hasn't been done yet, but... Um, uh, interestingly enough, there's a consortium of uh, university and researchers in the industry, the hydrogen industry, that look at Texas as uh, the next big hydrogen state. They don't even have an uh, efficient hydrogen, hyd hydrogen, whatever the, 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 yeah. uh, the thing. To well, convert. yeah, actually, Texas al along the, um, the coast and along the uh, uh, Houston Shipping Channel area, there is a long pipeline which is designed and operates purely on hydrogen. And that's for the purpose there is some of the petrochemical plants and refineries, hydro, they, they produce excess hydrogen and some of them need more hydrogen. So this basically is a, is a, a pipeline which moves the hydrogen from the excess to the, to the deficient plants. And that's been operating for years. No accidents, no problems. Yeah, scary stuff, though. <laughs> so is natural gas, yeah. if you don't do it right. <laughs> yeah. You're true. It, it's, a, it's a very small molecule. Mark, what about my prickly pear? Oh, biomass. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> okay. Um, the first kind of biomass that has been used, and we do have these, in, we even have this in Austin uh, at the Sunset Farms landfill. Um, is basically recovering methane that's produced naturally by the decomposition of garbage or, or by the uh, decomposition of sewage sludge in a, in a digester. We have Hornsby Bend. So that's making methane. Uh, that methane is used in power plants. Um, I don't know about prickly player, but uh, the, the next uh, fuel source, biomass fuel source, uh, is the, uh, the, the wood that is left in the forest by the, the um, timber industry, by the, by the timber jacks. Again, they, they cut the tree, they cut the treetops, which is mostly branches off, and they leave it. Well, now uh, guys are going out there with chippers and trucks, and they're bringing those wood chips to power plants. Um, it's turned out that it is probably more expensive uh, than conventional power, and as a result, uh, that technology has not grown 
as we sort of expected it would at one point. We guessed wrong. The people who build those plants are losing money. I don't know if any of you have followed the biomass situation in Texas, but uh, uh, Austin recently, within the last year and a half or so, Austin actually bought out its contract with a, a biomass company from who, which built the plant under uh, the contract with Austin to buy all the energy it produced. It turns out it didn't run an awful lot. Okay. But specifically prickly pears, I, I don't know. <laughs> any other Mark, questions? Is there any, um, any good discussion that you can and do in a rapid format uh, about smart grid uh, and how that impacts uh, generation and demand management? Uh, if I had time, I would attempt to it. Actually, I, I, I know, I know, how can I say it? I know enough about smart grid to, to not want to try to do that because uh, my knowledge is sort of superficial. Okay. Um, I was in a, I actually was listening to a webinar today talking about uh, that week of February 14th. And one of the presenters said, we could have used the smart grid meters in Texas in a much more um, intelligent fashion than we did if they had more warning. Well, actually, they had 10 days. You know, we had 10 days warning for that event. But he said, you know, uh, we could have isolated microgrids using the smart meters that we have, and we could have kept more people uh, with power than we did, but it didn't happen. So what he was suggesting is we should look into that for the future. If we face a similar situation, we should be prepared to use those smart meters that we've all paid for to effectively uh, isolate sections of the grid. And, and the sections I should point out are those folks who have solar on their rooftops. So, so Mark, your, yeah. your closing yeah. shot is whatever happened last month, who's to... Oh, oh my gosh! <laughs> not blame my closing them. shot. What yeah. And what should we do? What should have happened differently? Okay. okay. Number one, uh, looking back at history, uh, I, I always look at history. Has, has this happened before? And what happened afterwards? Well, in 1989, there was a cold snap, pretty severe. I wasn't here then, but I've read about it, um, which caused outages. And the, uh, the incident was followed by a legislative study and a report recommending with winterization measures in power plants and in the gas fields and the gas transmission system. It sat on the shelf, nothing was done. 2011, I remember, again, a cold snap, not as bad as this past one, but we did have rolling blackouts, ERCOT ordered outages and outages followed by another report, which was a little bit more detailed than the first one, which I did read. And essentially it listed all of the winterization measures, which, and again, it, it's gotta be not just the power plants, it's gotta be their fuel supplier, the gas companies and the gas wells themselves. A lot of those gas wells failed to just, they basically stopped pumping gas because of the water vapor in the gas, it froze, and the, those wells were frozen in. Uh, the report identified what measures must be should be taken to winterize the gas wells, all of the, the gas transmission system and all the instruments along the transmission path for the gas, the power plants. In power plants, it was largely instrumentation that's outdoors and exposed to the elements, which froze. And without those instruments, the plants won't work. Um, it, it came up with costs. Uh, as I recall, the total, looking at both the gas supply and the power plants, was something in the neighborhood of five to six billion dollars. Okay, we lost a whole lot more than that that week. Uh, so all I could say is, if you want someone to blame, the reports were made. The decision makers at the time, which would be the legislature, PUC, but really the legislature in 2011 could have ordered the
that those measures in the report be mandatory. They didn't do it. The report just sat on the shelf. Uh, so uh, right now, the, so somebody once said three's a charm. Well, here's our third chance. <laughs> maybe this time, because this was so much more severe, maybe this time they'll take the, those reports and uh, actually act on them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi. Oh, uh, can I ask one? Oh, quick yeah. Question? One more question. Let's close it out. Okay. We have time for one more question. Okay. Uh, uh, Mark, I sent you an email so you can ignore it, but uh, I'm. Um, uh, I thought this was a great lecture. The question Thank I you. have is, uh, with the uh, increasing usage of electric cars, yep. is that does that what kind of a uh, usage is that going to be like per, by percent in our electrical grid? Let's say if you know, 50% of the population has electric cars. Um, how would that compare with, uh, you know, just the standard usage you were seeing now from houses? Very good question. Uh, I, I have an electric car myself, I should point out, by the way, uh, I have a Nissan Leaf. Um, a lot of friends have electric cars now. Um, I don't remember the exact number. I, I do know that ERCOT figures, uh, they, they do several scenarios. They, they do a lot of scenario planning, um, especially figuring out what is the load profile going to be in the future. So they've got several scenarios, one of which is a, a, a is the, uh, what can I say, a, a very, very optimistic view of electric uh, vehicle market in the future and how many people are going to be using them. Um, here's some numbers I can give you, though. Okay, this this I do know off the top of my head, and I'm sorry, I, I don't know the total numbers, but um, I'm using my own experience, okay? Uh, and, and most electric cars, basically, you, you drive them about – four miles average, you drive it about four miles and you've used up one kilowatt hour, okay? So just figuring out, let's say I drive, uh, once the COVID is over, the, 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 uh, <laughs> once the quarantine is over, I'll go back to my normal driving, okay? I, I drive um, average 30 miles a day. In a typical day, 30 miles divided by four is seven and change, seven and a half. Um, I'm going to use seven seven kilowatt hours or so to recharge my battery. Okay, and average electric usage in average homes in Austin averaged over the year, 30 kilowatt hours a day. So again, we're just taking, you know, very, very simplistic. Average 30 miles a day, seven, a little bit over seven kilowatt hours, um, 30 kilowatt hours averaged over the year. It's, of course, twice as much in the summer and, and uh, you know, half as much or so in the, in, in the uh, spring and the fall. Um, but that's kind of the ratios that I see for just residential. So if everybody has an electric car, they're going to use seven kilowatt hours for more than they've been using for charging, recharging their car. And they're going to be uh, using about 30 on average, 30 kilowatt hours per day, averaged over the year. So that's about 20% more load. There you go. There you go. Yeah. But then again, you know, that, that didn't look at all at the commercial portion of the load or the industrial yeah. portion. Right. So, uh, yeah. Plus, it won't happen overnight. You'll see, you know, it will go over years. It won't. You won't wake yeah. up one morning and yeah. everybody has electric car. Yeah, yeah. I've actually, I have another presentation I've done just on electric cars, but that's another, that's another day. <laughs> I just want to make a comment. Sure. Um, People did recharge their electric cars. Most likely it would be at night. And on yeah. your graph, you showed that the wind power was stronger at night. Yep, that's so right. So that the capacity would, it's not like all of a sudden we would have to build maybe more capacity. We might be able to more efficiently use the capacity that we can generate. Thank you very much. That's an excellent point. You're right. Um, uh, Mark? Yeah. Does it make any sense for any of us to be looking at solar panels at this point? Because you mentioned quite a bit that the cost is so 
you know, a hundredfold less. And in fact, I was even thinking after this terrible blizzard problem, does it even make sense to put some Tesla batteries in the corner of a house or something <laughs> just so we have some power? Well, all I can say is um, the solar contracting industry in Austin is extremely competitive. Uh, you could easily get three contractors off the list, off the Austin Energy list. They have a contractor's list. It's easy to find on the website. Um, you could get bids. Uh, they should. They should. They're, they are committed to explain to you the economics, the, you know, not, not just what it'll cost, but give you their best estimate of how much it'll produce. And you can use your own calculator to figure out how much that's going to generate in savings on your electric bill. And, and again, the, the, the way Austin Energy does it now uh, is, is very straightforward. They have a separate meter for your solar. They read that meter. They read your regular meter. They On your electric bill, you'll see a credit line, kilowatt hours, solar times, it's something in the order now, it's nine point something cents a kilowatt hour that it's credited to your bill. So you know immediately, here's how much I saved. And in some cases, oh, by the way, the credit, if the credit exceeds your bill, they do carry it over to the next month. So uh, you're getting full, full value. Um, work the numbers out. Now on the, the issue of, okay, if you do have solar and it's done in the way that almost everybody does it, they don't put batteries in. On top of that, they, uh, the kind of inverter, I mentioned inverter before, that's the device which converts the DC to AC and synchronizes it with your, your home's use. The, the kinds of inverters that are used, unless you specify something differently, the kind of inverter they, that, that is almost always used will not operate if there's an outage if your house is if your house is not getting grid power uh the inverter will not operate part of the reason for that is protection part of it is that uh it'll it only will will operate if there is a battery bank in in your house such as a tesla power wall or or if you you when you bought the solar you specified i want this to operate even when there's no grid power and you tell the contractor that and then they know to, to put in the proper equipment and to put a battery pack in as well. Then you are truly protected against an outage up to the point that you've exhausted your battery and you're not getting enough recharge. However, you can you can figure the numbers out and you can look at the, the readout because you always get a readout on how the what's called the state of charge of the battery. So you will know how much juice is in the battery and what can I operate in my house without drawing the battery down to zero and then you're gonna be out. So you do have a level of protection if you wanna buy solar and you can compare the costs with and without this uh, extra package. So it's a long answer to a short question. <laughs> Almost all answers to engineering kinds of questions are, it depends, okay, but thank you. you can get all this information from the contractors and you won't have to pay them anything until you decide to contract with them. Okay. Okay. No more questions? Well, you have my email address, right? Yeah, I'm putting it back <laughs> in the chat too for if there are any lingering questions or additional questions, Mark was kind yeah. enough to to share that. Yeah, let me see. I get my chat right here. Okay, uh, email address there. You are the kind of spreading of costs could be used to help cover winter. Yes, that's absolutely true. Good, good point. Uh, the kind of spreading. Okay, uh, email address. Does that solar amount include rooftop solar? Um, yes, it includes both. But as I pointed out, even though, for example, Austin has six, or last time I looked, Austin had 6,000 uh, rooftop solar power systems. Um, that worked out to, I think it's a total of 30 megawatts on the roofs. And Austin has contracts for hundreds. I forgot how many hundreds exactly, but it's, it's something seven or 800 megawatts 
of solar farm contracts. So that's kind of the distinction between uh, many, many, many small systems and a, and a handful of, of really big ones. Okay, uh, kind of spreading the cost. Yeah, okay, my email address. Spread it. I, I see the same. Oh, look, okay. it's. Yeah, okay. Can the winterization package be added retroactively? Um, very good question. I, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but uh, I bet that the uh, wind, uh, wind farm owners are, they know what it would to what it would cost to add to retroactively add it oh by the way i should point out that the the wind turbines which were iced over and had to stop operating were mostly the ones along the coast along the uh um yeah the the gulf coast not so much the ones in the interior where it's drier okay Testing one. Oh, okay. Well, that's it. I think I got all the all the all the uh, chats. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for doing this and okay. for being with us. And thank you to all of you for coming out. We love to see you at Blue Knot events. Please be on the lookout. We have another one coming up in April, April 27th. We have Toba Hellerstein, who's the CEO of Texas Israel Alliance. Uh, she's going to wow. be speaking with Shai Lovshis, who's the council. Uh, the Council for Energy and Economic Affairs to the U.S. So stay tuned for details and title of that talk. Uh, but we're doing it a little differently. We're going to do it at the lunch hour um, on the 27th. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and again, thank you so much, Mark. And you Very all welcome. have his email address. And we hope to see you again soon. Thank you all for hanging in there for the whole uh, hour and a half. <laughs> Everybody stay safe. Bye. Bye.